The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God is available at www.desiringgod.org. I want to begin by directing your attention to the self-identification of God in Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. You can look at it if you want. By the way, with regard to the manuscript, as in the last several years, just to spare you the uh, trouble of trying to listen and write at the same time, if you want it, we will put this manuscript in your hands right after this gathering free of charge so that you can focus all your energies on listening, and if there's any juicy quote or anecdote that I tell, it'll be on paper, in your hands, five minutes after we're done, and you don't have to worry. You can be thinking about questions you want to ask me at the end instead of trying to keep track on paper of where I'm going. Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Now, you remember Moses has been called and commissioned by God to go down to Egypt to set the people free and lead them out of bondage. And Moses is frightened and he says to God that he doubts that he's the man for the job. And God says to him in verse 12, I will be with you. And then Moses says, when I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God's response at this point is, I believe, perhaps the most, at least one of the most important self-revelations of God in all the Bible. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, which is simply another form of Ehyeh, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name, Yahweh. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. And so it's very clear that the thousandfold used name of God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament is rooted by God explicitly in the phrase, I am who I am, Ehyeh, Esher, Ehyeh. Tell them, Yahweh has sent you. Tell them that the most significant thing you can say and the most wonderful thing you can say is that I simply and absolutely am. Now, I begin with this self-designation of God because my unhidden and unashamed aim in this message on John Calvin and in 10 years of hosting the Bethlehem Conference for Pastors is to fan a flame in you that you might have a passion for the centrality and the supremacy of God in your ministry. This is not distanced, merely objectified historiography. I have an agenda. A very clear theological sermonic agenda. And Calvin is my guinea pig this year. And it's the same message every year, and it hangs on the wall up there, and it's written on everything I write, and it's what I live for, and so there's no hidden agenda here. My aim is to fan a flame in you 
that your heart would burn for the centrality and the supremacy of God in ministry. My heart burns when I hear God say, Moses, tell them, I am. Doesn't yours? Tell them, I am sent you. My heart just burns when I read that. I want to get that. I want to see that. I want to taste that. I want to live that. It burns in me when I think about the absoluteness of the being of God. Never beginning, never ending, never becoming, never changing, never improving, to be dealt with on His terms or not at all. I just tremble inside when I hear God talk like that. So let it hit you, brothers. God, this God in whose name this conference exists, this God never had a beginning. Let it hit you. Everything changes if you see that. This God never had a beginning. Every kid I've ever had, all five of them, the only one's not there yet, at age three asks, where did God come from? That's the biggest question. God came from God. God is. What a statement. Oh, Calvin. One who never had a beginning, but always was and is and will be, defines all things. Whether we want him to be there or not, he's there. We don't negotiate with him for what we want reality to be. The arrogance of man. Oh, the way God is talked about today. The arrogance of human beings. As if we can negotiate the kind of God we get. When we come into existence, we stand before God who made us. He owns us. We had absolutely no choice in this. You have absolutely no choice in whether you come into being and stand before God and reckon with God or not. And no ranting, no raving, no sophisticated doubt or skepticism has any effect whatsoever on the existence of God. He simply and absolutely is. Tell them, I am has sent you. If we don't like it, we can change for our joy or we can resist to our destruction. But one thing remains absolutely unassailed. God is. He just is. You got to reckon with him. Or die. There is no choice. He is there. He's God. And therefore, brothers, let it hit you. What matters in ministry is God. Above all things, I cannot escape the simple. I used to think it was something you moved beyond. I cannot escape the simple, obvious truth that God must be the main thing in ministry. Because God is the main thing in life. And he's the main thing in life because he's the main thing in the universe. And he's the main thing in the universe because every atom and every emotion... And every soul and every angelic and demonic and human being belongs to God, who absolutely is. He created them all. He sustains them all. He directs them all because, as the apostle says, from him and through him and back to him 
is everything. To Him be the glory. He absolutely is. Tell them, I am has sent you. And so, on this 10th anniversary of the Bethlehem Conference for the Supremacy of God in Pastors, my desire is as strong as ever that God might inflame in you a passion for His centrality and supremacy in your ministry so that people will say of you when you are dead and gone, He knew God. He loved God. He showed us God week in and week out. He was, as the Apostle says, Filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3.19. Make that your prayer like it was the Apostles' prayer for the Ephesians. Now this is my aim and this is my burden for the Bethlehem Conference and for my life and for this church and for you and for your churches and for the nations. Because it's implicit in the sheer being of God. It's explicit in the teachings of the Bible. From Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. In Him we live and move and have our being. He's the end point. As John MacArthur ended on this morning, the glory of God is where Paul ends it all. He ends it all there every time. The glory of God. But also, not just those two reasons, but because next year's speaker, David Wells, thank God he said yes, finally. I've asked him for... Year after year after year, because I love this man. Everything he writes, I just say, yes, David. Yes, David. And one of the things he said that is so right is, it is this God, majestic and holy in his being, who has disappeared from the modern evangelical world. And then just in the most recent, no, it's December Christianity Today. Did you read that article about Leslie Newbigin? About Leslie Newbigin? Raise your hand if you read that article. Okay, not many, but it's good. It's a good article. You remember what he said there? He said, I suddenly saw... Now, this is just David Wells from a British perspective. I, I suddenly saw, he writes, that someone could use all the language of evangelical Christianity and yet... The center was fundamentally the self, my need of salvation. God is auxiliary to that. I also saw, he writes, that quite a lot of evangelical Christianity is can easily slip, can become centered in me and my need of salvation and not in the glory of God. And oh, have we slipped. How many are the churches today? I ask you, how many churches do you know where the dominant aroma, sound, feel, expression is the preciousness of the weight of the glory of God? How many are there? Now, John Calvin saw in his own day the same thing that Leslie Newbigin saw in India and in Britain in the last 50 years. And in 1538, the Italian Cardinal Satolet, trying to win back the city of Geneva, which had turned over to the Reformation just before Calvin came, trying to win them back writing to the city council, had written a long introductory section extolling the preciousness of eternal life before he gets to his vicious criticisms of the Reformation and John Calvin in particular. Well, Calvin was asked to write the response to this in the fall of 1539, he did it in six days. Luther read it and said, here is a writing with hands and feet. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Luther was 25 years older than John Calvin and admired him. Melanchthon stood in awe of John Calvin. John Calvin called him the theologian with trembling. Calvin's response to Sadolet is important because, and you can read it in this book. I recommend that you all have this book in, in your library. This is a collection. This is, this is for Luther. Dylan Berger did for Calvin what he did for his Luther collection. Get the Luther collection and the Calvin collection. Then you got everything you need right here. You don't need to buy anything else of John Calvin. You don't need it. But you can if you want to. I have a few others under here, like these. <laughs> you can read this there, that the response to Sadolet, one of the first things John Calvin wrote, established him as the reformer of, of Europe when he wrote it, didn't deal first with justification, didn't deal first with priestly abuses, didn't deal first with transubstantiation, didn't deal first with praying to the saints, didn't deal first with papal authority. All those come in for powerful treatment. But what he deals with first proves to be, I believe, the integrating issue of his life, the whole explanation of how he got to be who he was and why his theology was what it was, why the world is today what it is under the influence of Calvinism. It is the fundamental issue for John Calvin. It comes out over and over and over again, namely the centrality and the supremacy of the majesty and the glory of God. For example, he sees in Sadolet's puff of piety at the beginning something that Newbegin saw. Here's the way Calvin puts it. Your zeal for heavenly life is a zeal which keeps a man devoted to himself and does not even by one expression arouse him to sanctify the name of God. Sanctify the name of God. Your whole treatment of eternal life never even got to the main issue of whether going there should be for the glory of God. Calvin's chief contention with Rome comes out in his writings over and over again is that you can take true language and skew it so badly that it loses its whole center and foundation. What Calvin aims to do is something very different. So he goes on and he says, this is what you should do, Sadole, quote, set before man as the, as the prime motive of his existence, zeal to illustrate the glory of God. Now, there's the banner over John Calvin's life, preaching and theology. Zeal, there's passion to illustrate the glory of God. The essential meaning of John Calvin's life and preaching is that he recovered and he embodied a passion for the absolute reality, God is, and majesty of God. Benjamin Warfield wrote a big book that David Livingston loaned me on Augustine and Calvin. And it's pretty profound stuff. And he says, no man ever had a profounder sense of God than John Calvin. And that's the key to his life. No particular doctrine, not predestination, not election, not justification by faith, is the key that unlocks the life of John Calvin. Calvin. Gerhardus Voss wrote a very powerful essay. You, you should get Voss's collected shorter writings. Um, uh, pure, uh, they were called Puritan Reform. Um, Presbyterian Reform, it was called when it was published in 1980. Maybe it's still that. But you can get it. And in this essay, 
He writes about Reformed theology versus Lutheran theology. And he asks, why? What is it about Reformed theology, that is, the heirs of John Calvin, that enables that tradition to grasp the fullness of Scripture, unlike any other branch of Christendom? Let me put in parenthesis here. I argue a lot with Arminians. And I used to, I used to buy the criticism that Calvinists were driven by an ironclad logic and ride roughshod over the scriptures. Never have I seen such a hocus pocus in my life now that I've spent 20 years on this. It's exactly the opposite in all of my discussions. This is a system. I give a hoot about systems. I don't care about naming systems, but this is a theology that has embraced scriptures. And when you press scriptures on the Arminians in my denomination, they just go everywhere into philosophies. <laughs> How can this be? How could God do that? How could this fit with that? How can this? I said, I'm the logic chopper. Don't talk like that. Just text after text. And so this is true historically, whether whether you met some Calvinist along the way who just argued because, well, if this is true, this has to be true, blah, 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 and never quotes text. Forget that guy and go to the Bible. But historically, this system has been able to comprehend First Timothy 2.4, 2 Peter 3.9, Ezekiel 18.33, and many other texts, along with all the great Calvinist pillar texts, into one authentic, integrated, whole counsel of God. And Gerhardus Voss is very eager to find out why that is. Why? And here's his answer. Because, quote, because Reformed theology took hold of the scriptures in their deepest root idea. That's why. This root idea, which served as the key to unlock the rich treasuries of the scriptures, was, and then he puts it in italics, the preeminence of God's glory in the consideration of all that has been created. It's the relentless orientation on the glory of God that gives coherence to John Calvin's life and the Reformed tradition. Voss said, the all-embracing slogan of the Reformed faith is this, quote, the work of grace in the sinner as a mirror for the glory of God. Mirroring the glory of God of God is the meaning of John Calvin's life, mirroring the glory of God. Now, when he gets to justification, which he did very quickly to Satellite, when he gets to justification, this is what he says. You touch upon justification by faith, the first and keenest subject of the controversy between us. Wherever the knowledge of it is taken away, the glory of Christ is extinguished. There's the bottom line for Calvin. You don't begin with justification. This is what sets him apart from Luther. And this is a fundamental, that's too strong a word, a very significant difference in the two traditions as they come down. I mean, these men were eye to eye on the glory of God and the a sovereignty of God and the predestination of God and the election of God. Luther and Calvin stood on the same footing, but there was a slight nuanced starting point difference that has, I believe, made a difference in those traditions. And the glory of God is the starting point for John Calvin and those who have followed in his footsteps. That's the deeper root than justification. For Calvin, the need of the Reformation is this. This is a quote now from um, um, Parker, T.H.L. Parker. Rome, this is his interpretation of Calvin, I think it's right. Rome had destroyed the glory of Christ. 
in many ways. One, by calling upon the saints to intercede when Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Two, by adoring the Blessed Virgin when Christ alone is to be adored. Three, by offering continual sacrifices in the Mass when Christ, the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross is complete and sufficient. Four, by elevating tradition to the level of Scripture and even making the Word of God dependent for its authority on the Word of man. Calvin asks in his commentary on Colossians, how comes it? that we are carried about with so many strange heresies. He asks that. And here's his answer. Because the excellence of Christ is not perceived by us. That's what I was praying about, brothers, at the beginning. Something happened to this man. The excellence of Christ is not perceived by us. Which means, I believe, that where a passion for the glory of Christ weakens and the center shifts, everything shifts. Which bodes very poorly for us today in doctrinal faithfulness. And you can see it. Just think of them. Think of the shiftings that are happening today. There's a root. It is a marvelous thing. How conserving, as Spurgeon said, how conserving are the doctrines of grace to a hundred other doctrines. How preservative is an orientation on the absolute supremacy of the glory of God in all things. And when it is forsaken and not talked of much, and in fact, seminary teachers will say, I think the, the love of God should be stressed more. So many things follow right in the train. It doesn't even take a generation before heresies begin to follow in the train of the loss of the centrality of the majesty and the glory of God. For Calvin, the Reformation was needed because the glory of Christ had been extinguished. So the unifying root now, I'm arguing, of Calvin's life and labors is his passion to display God in Christ in his majesty and glory. When he was 30 years old, he looked to the end of his life and he described an imaginary scene, one of his writings, of himself at the last judgment, giving account to God. And this is what he anticipated saying. Oh, God, the thing at which I chiefly aimed and for which I most diligently labored was that the glory of thy goodness and justice might shine forth conspicuous, that the virtue and blessings of thy Christ might be fully displayed. Then, 24 years later, one month before he gave an account to the judge in death, he wrote in his last will and testament, I have written nothing out of hatred to anyone, but I have always faithfully propounded what I esteem to be for the glory of God. That was his estimation, at least, of his writing and his life. Now, here's my question. This is my key question that I want to try to answer and unfold with you. What happened to him? Because I want it to happen to all of them. My people. I want it to happen for the joy of all the nations. That's our mission statement up there on the wall. I want it to happen in your churches. Or in you, if it hasn't happened yet. What happened to John Calvin to make him a man so mastered by the majesty of God? And second part to the question, 
What kind of ministry did it unleash in Geneva when it happened? So that's my agenda for the remainder of our time.